Good morning or good afternoon. Greetings, I'm lurking by. Hello. 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 Hey, me. Hi, Louise. Hey, Raffaele. Good morning, good afternoon. Hey, am I pronouncing your name right when I call you Raffaele? I hope right. I am. Very correctly, very right. It's a, <laughs> it's a relief. <laughs> All right, we'll just wait a minute or two. And then we can move into uh, Raffaele, the 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 R presentation. I'll put the presentation into the chat window. Is it possible to get the presentation uh, comment only or view only link? I was going to say it's locked. Yeah, it's locked right now. It had to be added individually. I mean, uh, I think if there is a maybe a group, uh, email group, I, mean, I can enable that. I don't, otherwise, um, I don't know how to do it. I have no, to... you should be able to set it to like anyone with the link and view only. And then after this presentation, uh, it's probably best to be able to keep it at like uh, everyone with the link and view only. Yes. Do you want me to, um, Raphael, if it's if it's sort of on your internal and you can't share it, I can I can uh, make a copy and share that instead if you want. Yeah. Yeah, please do that. OK. Um, yeah, I can only I can only enable the link to Red Hatters. I cannot do it, make it publicly available, but I can enable people individually. Oh, I see. Got it. Alex, your way is best. I worked yeah. at Red Hat. I used to copy it to my personal account for community stuff and then share that using Gmail. I could probably do that too. But I mean, yeah, it's 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 what Alex is doing basically. So uh, after that, after today, I'm gonna use the his his copy if there is any update. Cool. All right. Let's, let's post the link. Can you can you open that one? Hooray! Cool. Yep. All righty then. I think um, it's five past. We should probably start. So I'll hand over to to. Uh, Raffaele, who's going to um, who's put a few slides together to summarize um, the documents that we've been working on um, to see if it makes it uh, easier to to get some of the concepts across and, and maybe provide some feedback. So over to you, Raffaele. Uh, thank you. Um, yes. So as you know, there is a much more detailed document that we are considering for you know maybe to publish where we where my intention and hopefully becomes the group intention is to talk about um, a cloud native approach to disaster recovery um, so this, i created this presentation just to make it easier to communicate but really that document has a, a ton more of details 
And, and the idea is you can still use all of your traditional DR approaches, but we think that there is maybe a, a new way to do uh, things with cloud native. And so we're gonna talk about that, okay? That's not to, so, so again, it's not to say that the other things, the other approaches cannot be used, typically the active passive approaches, but we we're looking at uh, we're going to try to give a definition to what cloud native disaster recovery might mean, and this is my um, my slides here to compare the two approaches. Um, so I, I'm going to go line by line, line by line. Um, in in uh, as far as disaster detection and the R procedure, traditionally there is a human decision. Okay something goes wrong and somebody triggers the DR procedure, then maybe the DR procedure is automated, but there is very often there is a human decision. What we want to get to with cloud native or what we define as cloud native disaster detection is, is that it's gonna be autonomous. So the system automatically understands the disaster and triggers whatever reaction is needed to be triggered. Then the DR procedure itself what I find with my customer is that normally it's a mix of automation and human, you know, manual actions. We want it to be fully automated in cloud native. In cloud native, the recovery time, so that's uh, how, for how long our system is down, uh, needs to be near zero. Um, it cannot be exactly zero because the, there are caches, there are load, load balances that need to switch, but it can be very close to zero. And normally we see it to be around minutes or two hours, right? In modern traditional data centers. The recovery point objectives, that is how much data I lose or how much inconsistency I have between copies of my data. Um, in traditional disaster recovery, I see it being between zero and hours, depending how we do the sync or backup and restore. In cloud native, it can be exactly zero. So full, full uh, consistency. Process wise, I, I see this pattern and you guys tell me if you see it, that's not true, but in traditional disaster recovery, the owner, the, the formal ownership of the DR procedure is on the apps. It's always been a responsibility of the apps, but what the apps do is this app uses this, this storage they turn around they turn around to the storage team and say ask the storage team what is your disaster recovery sla storage team has an answer and they say okay for this app that is the sla that we're going to get um so it really it, it, you know even if formally the dr procedure is you know, owned owned by the storage by the application team it, in reality it's owned by this by the storage team just now native yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry, just a quick question. I hope I can interrupt with questions. Is this okay? Or should we yeah, wait absolutely the okay. Yeah, okay. That's, that's the objective. Thank you. Uh, is it, when you say zero in the uh, uh, almost zero seconds, is that because the assumption is that the it's the same cloud or it's the same region? No. Uh, when you do a DR, not across, like, uh, across far regions or across the clouds? No, that's not the assumption. The assumption is we are going to go, we have geographically distributed workloads, possibly across different clouds, and we still get near zero. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and instead, uh, going back to ownership in, in cloud native, it's, it's an application responsibility. The other observation I made is that in terms of technical capabilities, most in, tra in traditional disaster recovery, most um, we, we leverage capability mostly from the storage side. So backups, volume syncs, um, the, and this kind of capabilities. But to build this cloud native disaster recovery infrastructure um, or architecture, we we need capabilities from networking, and in particular, we need we're going to see that we we need his ability to communicate is west so if i am in two different clouds this cloud I have to be able to communicate um, um, horizontally east west and to have uh, a good 
global load balancer capability. And that's that's where the switch happens, right? Um, so, yeah. I mean, just, just a quick comment here. I, I think, um, You know, I think we may need to differentiate between sort of what the high level objectives are and what happens in reality, right? Because, you know, to have recovery point objective of zero is, is certainly doable and it's plausible, but it also kind of means, um, it, it, it sort of also implies that, that every transaction or every database action or every you know, file action or whatever the application is using is is going to be synchronously happening across multiple sites, um, which which may or may not be the case, right? So 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 you know, I think I think zero could be the target. That's a bit, that's a, that's achievable, but it, it's 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 because we're enabling the automation, and I think I think that's the point that we're trying to make here, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, perhaps I see what you mean, Alex. The, not not every time I, I may need to get to zero, right? Not always right. I may need to get to zero, right? Now, here the point I'm trying to make is now you can get to zero uh, and it's not that complicated. We, you know, the, the narrative was you can do DR as, you can make DR as good as you want as long as you're willing to spend a lot of money, right? I think with cloud native approach, that narrative changes a little bit. This, these architectures are not that more expensive than the traditional, you know, active passive ones. Uh, and, and so much so that in, in, in an article that I wrote about this, I called it the democratization of, of zero downtime, right? During a disaster, because I think anyone who can swipe a credit card and start deploying on different clouds can achieve this in a, in a way that is not that expensive. So that's that's the point here that it's it's achievable and it's not that expensive. Yeah, I think it's not just about cost. To Alex's point, and we had the presentation last week. I think it was called Fubo FS, or that they were talking about performance trade-offs, how they were not POSIX compliant. So I think it's not just about cost; it's also about performance because True. if you want to have zero RPO, you have to write to all, you know every single zone and get back acknowledgements and so it's not all about costs. Agreed, agreed. There are some, certainly some use cases where performance trump consistency uh, and that's totally fine. Uh, we, we can, we can, I totally acknowledge that. Cool. Okay, so high level, this is the reference architecture. Um, we assume there are let's say three data centers in three faraway regions. Uh, if you, region is, if you're thinking about the cloud or it could be your three data centers in a different ge geographical locality. If you think about uh, on-premise, it doesn't matter. The, the architecture works anyway. There is uh, a stateful workload. You can imagine a database or a queue, right? That um, uh, is, is distributed across this data center to form a logical entity, but obviously there are different instances. And these instances communicate between each other via this horizontal east-west ability to communicate. Uh, we don't need to know at this, you know, in this reference architecture how that is implemented, but they need to be able to communicate east-west. So find each other, look up each other, and uh, discover each other, and uh, and communicate, and that's how they achieve data sync, you know, state sync. Each of them will have a volume, so we need storage, of course, because we're still <laughs> storage doesn't go away. But but we don't ask those volume implementation of that that you know that volume uh, that storage implementation. Um, we don't ask you to have any particular capabilities besides the ability to obviously store data. And then we can imagine that there is a front end or maybe just direct connection, but probably there's gonna be a front end, a stateless front end, and then there is a global load balancer, okay? Uh, and so the idea is when one of these regions goes down because of a disaster, uh, first the stateful workload 
adjust itself because it has some kind of you know leader election and state sync protocol and we can analyze those in detail uh, but uh, it adjusts itself instantaneously there is no data loss and then the global load balancer has some level of health checks has some health checks uh, and so uh, clients will start going only to the regions that are active okay so as a so we 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 reacted to a disaster uh, completely in a, an autonomous way and the clients keep working maybe they get they get a glitch of a few seconds i work with a database that where the glitch can be up to nine seconds uh, and then uh, but but then everything continues to to function normally okay so that's the idea uh, i think it's the general model the the trick is to find stateful workload that can actually work that way <laughs> and there are some prerequisites that they have to implement in order to do this and this stateful workload so i just mentioned q and and databases but obviously it could be a distributed uh, storage although performance there could could become an issue it could be a distributed cache you know it could be it could be anything that uh, needs to manage a state so in order to understand why this works i need to bring to mind some concepts so was there and uh yeah so sorry so um i was wondering uh in this reference architecture we basically say that for the dr we are uh basically this implies the state sync is down always going to be down by the applications right right and application have to have uh, ability to operate replicas across different data center which like potentially has very high latency right and so that's the on this is uh, is there any other model we consider or is this going to be our like only reference architecture for the dr well you like for for this model that's 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 how the application needs to work like i said and, and like the slide says you can still do your active passive models or master slave uh, you know that um uh, I've always worked, right? But you don't get all the automations that that I described. Um, yeah. So, Go ahead. Maybe, maybe I'd like to suggest sort of a slight refinement here, and mostly to do with the terminology, right? Um, when we when we put the the sort of the storage landscape my paper together, we kind of talked about. Um, different ways of of persisting data, and that um, you know that could be um, some sort of volume, but it could also be you know um, app level stuff like like a database, but also you know key value stores or 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 um, object stores, for example, are also are also you know valid ways of of, of persisting data, and and you know whether it's distributed storage that's providing volumes or a distributed database or a distributed key value store, right? I think what we're kind of saying here is the stateful workload needs to have a distributed way of persisting the data. And that, that could be, you know, distributed volumes. It could be, you know, like, like um, a distributed file system or a distributed storage system. It could be a distributed database, you know, like a, Cockroach DB or Yetabyte or 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 um, Fites or something, or it could be, um, you know, a distributed object store, and in that case, then you kind of have that 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 sort of functionality um, available to the to the application. I think. Yeah. So so I, I think it would kind of be useful to to sort of change the stateful workload to sort of some sort of distributed storage layer. And the volume is ultimately where data has persisted, but it's not necessarily, you know, it could be a distributed volume in, the, in, in that blue layer, potentially, I think. Right, right. I agree. Um, yeah, so I didn't 
say what service this stateful workload offers to the grid yeah. layer, right? And that this service could be storage, right? Or it could be key value store, or it could be SQL, or it could be queue. You know, it could be anything. Uh, uh, but yes, I think I can improve this slide by uh, by adding that that uh, piece of information. And so, yeah, this this volume here, uh, like I said, could be the the disk on which this stateful workload is running, or it could be another layer of software defined storage. It doesn't really matter because the state sync is managed at this layer, the blue layer. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So, um, one second. I'm taking note on this. Okay, so I was saying, um, you know, so the, 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 the document that I wrote tries to explain why this is technically feasible, right? Because you, you might say, I don't believe that this can be done, right? Well, we haven't done it for many years. Why now is it possible, right? Uh, so I, I try to explain uh, why, and um, the, I just have to remind you of a few concepts. Uh, so I think everybody knows what high availability and disaster recovery is. I just wanted to, I wanted to find them in a, in in relationship to what a failure domain is. Okay, so failure domain is something is an area of IT of our IT system that uh, um, when 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 th there could be a single event that uh, makes everything running in that area fail. Okay. Uh, so it, it could be a node, for example, which means all the process running on the nodes now fail. It could be a rack, which means all the, all the nodes running on the rack fail, fail, or a Kubernetes cluster, or a network zone, a data center, right? So a failure domain is sort of a um, fractal concept that is out of similar at different scales, but. Um, uh, in, in what we need to rem remember here for this discussion is when we talk about a high availability relative to failure domain, we really are asking the question, what happens when one component fails within this failure domain, right? What happens to my system when one component fails? Um, assuming a, a HA of one, right? a, a high availability, full tolerance of one, I'm assuming that that is what we mean by high availability. When we talk about disaster recovery, really we are asking the question, what happens if everything in this failure domain is lost? So basically the failure domain fails, what happens to my system? Obviously I need to have other failure domains somewhere. And normally in this case, the failure domain is the data center. By conventionally, when we talk about disaster recovery, we talk about an entire data center going down. Okay, so with this in mind, um, I'll continue because I'm sure everybody knows um, this this concept. Um, this consistency here we, we mean we mean uh, that all instances are observing the same state and are reporting on the same state. It's it's not the consistency of ACID, which is more about multi-threading on a single instance and every every thread seeing the same state. Um, yeah, I think I think we we define um, consistency in the white paper pretty well. Right. I, I, I really like this slide in that I think we should what we should sort of pop out of this slide is that high availability is about sort of the the, the recovery from a single point of failure or something like that. Um, whereas disaster recovery we're talking about the failure of an entire failure domain and and, and, and that's that's a really useful um, differentiation to have. Right. And and it's um, I, I felt the need to make this differentiation because um, these two concepts, when you talk to the customers these days, are starting to overlap because rightfully so, they would like to treat a disaster recovery event like if it was an HA event. And and in this theoretical model that I just described, that is exactly what happens. But unfortunately, 
that also brings confusion between these two concepts. <laughs> mm. uh, and so it's, it's important to, to understand what the difference is. Uh, con continuing, the other thing we need to remember is the cap theorem. Again, I'm pretty sure you guys know what it is. Um, many, you know, the common way to, to explain the cap theorem is you can have, uh, thinking about the consistency, availability, and partition, you, you can have, you can pick two, but not all of three. I like, I like to tell it in a slightly different way that I think helps in this discussion, which is that you don't choose partitioning. Uh, network partitioning is something that happens. <laughs> you know, miss the errors will happen, right? So assuming that you need to be partition tolerant, how do you design your workload? Do you design it to be available or do you design it to be consistent? So that's really in my mind, the choice that you have. And I have, um, and I have here a table showing some of these choices made by, by some products you should, um, Obviously, every every stateful workload that attempts to solve that attempts to be distributed has to deal with this theorem and has to make a choice here. Um, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is the concept of the consensus protocols. Okay, so hey, hey Rafael, so, sorry, just just on one step. Um, when you say uh, the capped choice for those examples, for example, MongoDB is consistency, as in it allows um, deferred consistency or or it's optimizing for uptime. What did you mean by that? So when you choose consistency uh, in, in the cap theory, it means that when the system goes into network partitioning, which is, which is where the system cannot establish anymore if if there is a piece of the system that is actually working and the other is not working, but it doesn't know what what the other piece of the system is uh, is doing. Then it puts itself in, in a not available state, which could mean read only or maybe just rejection of calls, uh, and because the the objective is to maintain the the state consistent. Certainly, right. it doesn't accept writes anymore, right? While Cassandra and DynamoDB will keep accepting writes even if they don't know the state of a piece of the rest of the system, assuming that they, because they assume they can do eventual consistency when all of the system, all of the instances will restart uh, to be able to communicate. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the problem, so eventual consistency is, is um, an appealing approach and i think it has been explored a lot there is now some emerging there is a line of thought you may agree or not but there is a line of thought that eventual consistency is kind of a dangerous path because eventual consistency does not imply eventual correctness it just implies that at some point in the future and there is really no sla that you can put on that statement but just at some point in the future all the instances will agree on the state. It doesn't mean that the state is what you would have expected from a business stand to, business logic stand to, uh, point of view, right? So, so the developers now have to take extra care to make sure that uh, they catch these these incorrect, in, uh, cons, you know, consistency decision because there is a conflict resolution, you know, algorithm in, in this. In this um, in this stateful workload that decides when there is an inconsistency that decides who's who's right maybe with a timestamp or something else. So now the de developers have to take care of that and yeah there are some papers like Google or some you know um, thread in, in where they discuss how painful it was to remedy those kind of things and so. At least this this line of thought, and I, I like that line of thought is let's keep everything consistent consistent with the risk of taking an outage. But um, it's it's simpler for from a developer point of view to in many in many cases, uh, right? It's simpler to, to operate that way. There are situations where inconsistency doesn't matter too much, um, and so in those cases, it's fine to use to use um, those databases, but. I work a lot in financial institutions. It, consistency is important, is very important there. Um, so I'm going, I'd, but, but this this was 
to explain why I focused here on consistency. So the, and, and that's, that is really what we mean when we say uh, zero RPO, right? It's, there is no, there is no inconsistency. There is no data loss. So uh, consensus protocol, uh, I invented these two definitions, uh, share state and unshare state. This is really my terminology. We can change it, uh, but the, the concept is well, well. Let's let's find consensus protocol first. Is the idea that I have I have a distributed workload that is need, needs to act as a single logical entity. So the the various instances need to agree on actions to be taken, right? Um, and there are two kind of protocols to agree on actions. The one here, the first one here, share state is when we have to agree on all of us, you know, all of the instances doing the same action. So we, sh we share the state, we share the action. And um, now, at least from an academic standpoint, the, the way you solve this problem is with a little election kind of uh, consensus protocol where the strict majority can agree on, on the action to be taken and they commit that action and then the, the others that are followers or were not able to to agree on the on the on the action they, they just have to follow and, and do the action later when when they come up online or they are able to join the network um, the major um, algorithm uh, in this uh, in this area are Paxos and Raft and Raft is gaining uh, popularity because it's much easier to understand. I, I could even understand it. Paxos is, <laughs> is, is just magic uh, if you try to read it. Um, and then um, there is a shared state consensus protocol where the participants to these orchestrations really are, are can potentially do different actions. So maybe I'm writing to a database and then another participant is sending a message in a queue, right? So in this case, um, we have the, the historically well-known two-phase commit and three-phase commit algorithm. But notice that these algorithms require all of the instances to be online, essentially. There, there is no tolerance to network partitioning when you do, when you do unshared state consensus protocols. And that's it's understandable, right? We are not doing the same thing. So, or potentially we are not doing the same thing. So we all need to know what we are doing individually. We cannot ask later. So um, there are a couple of um, papers from Google that based on this uh, shared state consensus algorithm, you can build a reliable replicated state machine, which means there is a generic way of of uh, agreeing on the state. And then on top of these, and you know, and Raft does a generic way on agreeing, not just on a state, but on a series of actions to be taken with the concept of operation log. And that's really the state that is being uh, shared between these instances. And then every instance has to do the operation that is written in the operation log. And then building on top of this concept, there is the concept of reliable replicated data store where now the action here is I have, a, I, have a, I have a series of operation, I have a log of operation to, to do, but really the operation is to write something on, on, a, on a data store. So this is a concept, a very highly reusable concept that, they, um, that could be implemented generically. And then on top of this, I could, I could put an API to serve some kind of storage uh, service, right? So it could be an API to do Q could be an API to do SQL and, and all the things we said before. And this is as has gone beyond um, sorry, beyond theory now, because if you look at the Apache Bookkeeper project, it's here in the note on the left. That is exactly a reliable replicated data store with with uh, with the abstraction, the, the operation that they abstract is really the the, the things that Kafka does. So append only operation to a, to a sort of a file system file. And in fact, uh, Apache, Book, Apache Bookkeeper is being used to implement 
highly distributed, uh, geographically distributed queue system. And Pulsar, if you want to take a look, Pulsar is one of such implementations. So putting it all together, um, we have we have uh, replicas, as we know, in uh, so, so a, a stateful workload can have replicas. And we, we have just studied how we can um, we can coordinate this replica with, with Paxos or Raft. And then we can have partitions, which is I, I partition the data set um, so that each, each, uh, each uh, group of replicas has to manage um, a subset of the, of the data set. And I do that for being able to scale horizontally, right? And partitions, it's, it's an, one of those cases where partition A and partition B are doing different things. So if I happen to have to coordinate a transaction that touches two partitions, there I, I have to use one of the unshared state protocols, okay? So I can use shared state protocols between replica. I can use unshared state protocol between, between uh, partitions. And that, that is how I can create a highly scalable, uh, highly scalable state of workload. Uh, a distributed stateful workload. And here I have collected some <clears throat> examples of these of these workloads because there are starting to be many. Um, like I said, not everything will work in the way that I have described in the initial slide, but there are starting to be many of these. And I, I try to collect what they do for the replicas and what is the consensus protocol for the replica and what is the consensus protocol for the partition. And some of them don't support partitions. Um, some of them don't have interpartitions uh, operations. Uh, they support partition, but they, you can only work with a single partition uh, at any given time. But in general, this is, um, I, I thought it was a good, a good exercise. And I thought these are actually the right question to ask if you are examining a in a state of workload and making the decision whether you want to use it or not. This is how you can understand what you can or cannot do in terms of reacting to failure in a, in a distributed way. Okay. Um, the other thing I, I look Sorry, could you explain what do you mean by partition consensus protocol? Like, what do you mean by? So, what partition is, is the Concept of partition, clear. Some some use yeah. shards. Some you know it's it's a there are several terminology, right? But yeah, so so um, a client may try to do an operation that needs to touch multiple partitions, right? Mm -hmm. So far so good. Yeah. Um, so for example, um, let's say uh, I think in in Elasticsearch. When I, I each index is a different partition or some something similar like that. So if I try to add a lot uh, any, any piece of information, a document in in two index with a single transaction, I need to do that operation across these two partitions, right? So how do I coordinate that? I need. I need because the operation is not going to be the same because the partitions they deal with different data sets, right? So how do I coordinate that? That is usually up, that happens with uh, one of those unshared um, state coordination protocol. Did I explain? Maybe I wasn't very clear. Okay, um, so I guess you know, it kind of depends on how you look at it because replicas can also do you know partitions or at least? But he, here, basically, you're meaning um, if you're doing so, look, you use the ref term replica to talk about different copies of the same object, whereas partition, you're talking about grouping of objects or, you know, operations across different objects. So that's what you mean by partitions. Look. As opposed. So let's say let's say my data set goes from A to Z, right? I could say that I want my uh, partition A to, to deal with 
a a to m say and then partition b to deal with n to z okay so i div i divide my data set into different ranges uh, my entire data set into different ranges and each partition is is essentially a standalone state of workload just operating on a on a shorter interval of that data set and they don't have each partition doesn't have to know anything about the other partition except when the client wants to do an operation that logically touches two partitions okay if, if i'm working only only on on the range from a to m what did i say before m i am just interacting with partition a and i can i just have to make sure that each replica is replicating the state right across the partition a but if i am inserting a a, a piece of information in in partition A and in partition B at the same time, then I have to, and I want to do it in a single transaction, then I have to find, I have to have a way to make sure that partition A and partition B agree mm -hmm. that they're doing that operation. Yeah, I, I don't, maybe, um, maybe I see where, where, what, what you're sort of pointing out. It's, I think the use of partitions here is possibly unhelpful from a terminology point of view. And maybe it would be easier if we just call them shards, simply because, you know, partitioning as in the verb when applied to the cap theorem is sort of different from partitions when we're referring to a shard. So, mm. so maybe we want to call them shards over here rather than partitions. Okay. Yeah, I find that... <laughs> Each each stateful workload uses a different term for this concept. I thought partition yeah. was the one that in English meant the closest thing, <laughs> but I don't have a problem changing to something else. Yeah, I, th I think when we 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 had to, in fact, th this was one of the things that we debated when we were putting the, the landscape together, and we sort of um, ended up putting a table to describe um, shards and replicated shards and sharded replicas as well because different storage systems apply them in different ways um but yeah I, I think it would just make it easier for everyone if we if we call them shards on this slide okay i can do that cool taking notes all right um so i I'm sorry gentleman that was asking the question yes, thank you yeah I understand. yeah okay cool um, so these are just um, um, some databases, uh, no, some, some stateful workloads that uh, uh, I have classified along those um, parameters. Um, I think we should have more. <laughs> uh, we, we should extend this table to, to more, um, more products, but that's what, that's what I have so far. Um, the other thing, I. Um, what, we, what I've explained so far is really generic and it would work anyway, anywhere or with any deployment, but I thought we could take a look, a closer look to Kubernetes and how this would work in Kubernetes. Right? So it's essentially the same slide as before, except that now there is a Kubernetes cluster in which uh, our workload is running. Uh, so we can Mm, we can translate it to more close, um, more closely to Kubernetes concepts. So we have a persistent, we will have a persistent volume, we will have ingresses. The global load balancer has to um, load balance for, you know, to this ingress or, you know, ingress is used in generic terms. So this could be a load balancer service or it could be an ingress object. And this is where you see better what, what I meant by I need to have this east-west cap uh, you know networking capability because building uh, building that across clusters is not that uh, it's not necessarily easy, straightforward today with with Kubernetes it, it can depend on the CNI implementation that you're using on, or the cloud where you're running. Still, if you can do it, uh, you know. Still, this is a, the a requirement for this database for these workloads to to be able to to be stood up that way. 
Okay, uh, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with Kubernetes, so not much to say here, um, not much else to say. Uh, I didn't set up the demo. I mean, I have it set up, but I did, wasn't planning to run it today. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, we I could certainly run uh, a demo in one of the next day, but just to explain in one of the next meetings, just to explain what um, what the demo is about, I uh, we would have this cockroach uh, database that is distributed across clusters in three different uh, regions. Right now, my setup is on AWS, but could be could be anything. Um, we we deploy a network tunnel in the case of i'm running on openshift so in the case of network um, in the case of openshift we need to deploy a network tunnel to make this cluster be able to talk to each other in, a, in an horizontal way so without doing egress and ingress right this we, we are essentially merging the sdns into a single larger uh, software defined network so that everything is routable and discoverable uh, to do that we use a pro we use an operator and a product called Submariner, which was initially developed by uh, Rancher, but now I think is joining the CNCF uh, as a, as a product, um, and that is ba basically it establishes a um, IPsec based VPN across the across the um, SDNs of the clusters. And then um, we de I deploy a global load balancer with health checks on Route 53 using using an operator that uh, talks to Route 53 and and makes this configuration. So this, from a cockroach pers perspective, we have nine instances because we need uh, the way cockroach work. It's it's better not not mandatory, but it's better if you do local. Um, um, what is it called? Um, local majority, so local uh, leader selection and then global leader selection. Um, and then, uh, so we have nine instances, but they behave like a single cross regional entity. Okay. And then the way the demo works is I take down, I take down one, uh, one region and we see that the clients keep keep just working normally. We, we set up some client here that run the TPCC test, which is a standard SQL test for highly, you know, highly transactional operations on a SQL database. And we, we see that obviously we kill this instance, but we see that the other instance keep working. Um, and this, this is, this could be our stateless front end, but here we're just generating a bunch of transactions. Hey, Rafaela, so is, is that, you know, is, is some sort of uh, network tunneling like, like with Submariner um, mandatory for this sort of architecture or? So the ability, so all, all of these state of workloads, the way they, and I'm working with others, the, the way they work is each instance need to discover and establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection with, with all the other ones. That's necessary for the raft coordination to work. So, so discovery and connectivity is needed. The way you implement it, that's up to you, right? Um, for example, I know that we, if you use the if you use the Google Kubernetes service, you can build a cluster and switch a flag where if all the other clusters are in Google, you know, regions, they will just be able to talk directly. So it's they they give it they give it to you. But other implementation of or other distribution of Kubernetes may not have this capability, right? So you have to somehow provide it. And in um, I can only talk about OpenShift for this particular capability. In OpenShift, that's how we are doing it. Right. And in this in this instance um in this sorry in this example um the the database has nine nodes total three in each region um 
does is does that behave like a single logical database? Is 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 that kind of the the the, the gist of this here? Yeah. Yes, it's the can it's the gist it's the gist, and it's exactly what happens. It's actually nice to see. That's why maybe next time I'll. Um, um, yeah, I, if you guys want to see this demo, I'll be happy to show it to you. I'll be very happy to show it to you. But yes, it's, it behaves like a single database for, from the client's perspective. Um, could, could you highlight on this slide to, for just to you know, follow the previous slides uh, where you're doing your replicas and where you're doing your shards? I mean, I, it's pretty oh, obvious. Yeah pretty obvious that you want your replicas in the regions and then you're you're sharding within that but it just it, it would be nice to since you have three and three here it's not clear uh, or yeah, obvious yeah. um so this is where we we start talking about the second generation of uh, state of workload which decide the sharding by themselves so cockroach Based on how you use the data, uh, can reshard, can reshard, and can decide how to shard. So you can hint when you create tables. You can hint how to shard them, but you don't have to, and it knows what to do. It's really, really equals. I think um, they use the name tablets for shards. <laughs> so that's yet another name. <laughs> okay, and and it creates its own tablets. Um, you don't have to decide it. Um, and uh, these are nine replicas. So all the database is, re is, is fully replicated everywhere, except we don't have to have all of these instances agree to in order to proceed with that transaction. And that's, that's how they can make it efficient. Um, we, I, I, did, I did this with the Cockroach guys and you really, for this question, you need to talk to them, but um, we run a performance test. Uh, so keep in mind in, um, in Amazon between East, the US East and US West region, <clears throat> there is about 70 milliseconds of latency. So that's, that's just physics. There is nothing you can do around that. But um, with that kind of latency, we st we're still able to run the TPCC test with 97% efficiency which the TPCC 1000, sorry. So that emulating 1000 databases uh, doing uh, OLTP, so highly highly transactions kind of operations. So not, it's not uh, data warehousing or, you know, big queries is more insert, insert select, insert select, these kind of things. So with that kind of uh, traffic pattern, uh, emulating 1000 instances, we did 64, Four percent, which um, sorry, uh, ninety-six <laughs> percent, which is um, which is almost the same that you would get from a monolithic database. Probably monolithic database can do a little bit more, but it's it's close to the theoretical limit of one hundred percent. So uh, they were uh, they were happy with the result. Uh, they they could already do achieve those results running on VMs, but we'll, the exercise here obviously was running on containers and, and inside of OpenShift. Hmm. I guess from a concept point of view, this, this applies to, to just about any distributed um, storage, right? If, if, if you have if you have a logical instance that combines sharding and replicas between the between between sort of multiple cluster instances and you have some sort of network tunneling then this this can apply to potentially distributed file systems and key value stores and object stores and and so 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 you know we can probably make this um, a fairly generic play as well Right, that, that, that's my objective here. I, I don't think it matters what the stateful workload does. What, what we are finding a solution for here is replicate state across regions, right? And 
um, or keep state in sync across the region is better. Uh, so I think it can be done with other you know, interfaces because this is a SQL interface, right? It's, it's a SQL service. I think it can be done with other type of uh, stateful services. In fact, I would like to be able to showcase this, this same architecture with other kind of workloads um, because it, it proves the point, right? It, the, the point right now, one might say, okay, it works with Cockroach CB, but it's not a gen general solution. But if I can make it work with other uh, products, then it starts to be a generic statement, more of a generic statement. So I'm, I'm collaborating with other um, partners to see if we can recreate the same kind of deployments. I guess the part that can vary across different distributed databases or file systems is how they consume this topology. So for this demo, like how did you convey this topology of, you know, there are three different availability zones and, you know, how did you make Cockroach aware of this topology? So proper sharding happens across AZs, you know, as opposed to within the yeah. same AZ. Cockroach has um, some um, parameters that you need to pass to the process when you run it to make it topology aware. So using downward API and other approaches, I, I make the, the pod the pods aware of where they run. And then, and that's how it decides to do the sharding, right? Because like I said, it's a, uh, that's, that's a mm -hmm. nice property of it, mm -hmm. of that it, it does all the sharding. I see, so like the node labels on labels. Like right, that. right, um, yeah, yeah. Cockroach understands one la level of topology. Um, I'm working with another database now, Yugabyte, which understand multiple la layers of topology potentially. So it understands uh, cloud, uh, region, and, and uh, AZ. And you, so passing these parameters, you, you make it aware of where each instance runs, and then they can make a decision on how to distribute the data. Mm. I guess, you know, it probably therefore makes sense to have a short section or, or, or a slide or, or, or something to, to cover discovery and topology, as in, you know, how do the nodes discover each other, and how do the nodes, um, and, and and how do you kind of, um, like, define the topology somehow, somewhere? Because it could just be it could just be labels, but but just as equally, right? They could be they could be um, looking at data up in a, in a in a discovery service as well. Right. Yeah, there are. It, yeah. Um... And I think, uh, yeah, I, I can create a slide on that. I think I talk about that a little bit in the document. It started to, it start, it, it, it becomes uh, implementation dependent very quickly. That that's all. I, <laughs> that's the caveat. Yeah. So it, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I'm 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 not suggesting we start to define how they how they do it. Just mm -hmm. that we kind of need to tell people if you're looking to build this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Architecture, you, you, you need to figure out how you're going to do your discovery and your topology. Yeah, um, topology is is uh, fundamental. Discovery and topology are fundamental. In in the case of Submariner, it comes with a discovery service. So, if I know what what to look up, if I know the name of the you know, if I know the name of these these are stateful set, right? So if I know the name of these individual instances, uh, I can look them up from this cluster just because I have a gener generally distributed uh, discovery service. But yes, other, if you don't use Samarina, you will have, will have a way, you need, you need a way to do that, right? Um, um, for example, Cilium, if you know Cilium is, is another CNI that you can, um, you can configure in your Kubernetes cluster, Cilium support network tunneling out of the box. So it's, hmm. it's a switch that you can turn on. I think, uh, what is the other famous one? Uh, the other famous CNI. Oh, oh. Calico. Calico, yeah. Calico. I think Calico does the same. I think Calico has the same capability if you, if you look into that. <clears throat> Interesting. We, we, we maybe 
maybe it's worth pinging um, the the SIG network and seeing if they have any information about those those product capabilities. Yeah, we can do that. And um, the multi, I think it's the multi cluster SIG, but um, there is some SIG that has defined a standard, as a final spec for uh, cross cluster discovery. They don't define the tunneling, but they define the cross cluster discovery. And uh, Samarina implements that spec. Got and, it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, we're actually a minute over, so I think we're going to have to call time. But but this was um, this was brilliant, Rafael, and I think we've got something solid to 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 work on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone, um, and we'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you, Rafael. Bye bye.